Tradcast Express. Tradcast Express, it's Saturday, October 7th, 2023. What a week. What a week it's been. Every day this past week, you just didn't know what to do first. Somehow everything was hitting at the same time. Here are the major things that happened in the last, well, let's say, nine to ten days. First, the Catholic Identity Conference of the Recognize and Resist crowd here in the U.S., then a consistory of new cardinals in the Vatican, followed by a pre-synod ecumenical prayer vigil in St. Peter's Square, the publication of dubia on the synod by five cardinals, plus Francis's response to them, plus follow-up dubia Francis has refused to answer, then Francis answering a set of dubia submitted by Cardinal Duca on Amoris Laetitia, then the Synodal Tower of Babel Conference in Rome, then the release of Bergoglio's new apostolic exhortation Laudate Deum, then the opening and first few days of the Synod. Then let's back up a few more days and note that the Kazakh Auxiliary Bishop Athanasius Schneider, I call him now the world's most significant, insignificant Novus Ordo Bishop, released a provocative prayer for the 2023 Synod on Synodality on September 28th, and on September 19th had published his own semi-trad catechism called Credo. And of course, that's now being hailed by some as the greatest thing ever. But anyway, I don't mean to get into that now. I just wanted to mention all these major things happening in just the past few days and weeks. And the remainder of the month of October promises to be busy too. Francis has threatened to release a new apostolic letter on October 15th, and the Synod will continue until October 29th. And finally, there will be another Recognize and Resist conference in Rome regarding the Synod, the Rome Life Forum, and that will begin on October 31st and end the following day. So, yeah, lots going on, so let's get started looking at some of these things a bit more in depth. First, the dubia. For those who don't know what that means, dubia is the Latin word for doubts and refers to questions that clergy can submit to the Holy See when there is something they want clarification on. And that's something that was done before Vatican II as well. For example, in 1909, the Pontifical Biblical Commission was asked whether, in Genesis chapter 1, the word day means a 24-hour period, so that when it says that God created the world in six days, it would mean in six 24-hour periods or whether it was permissible to believe that by day is meant just an unspecified period of time. And the Holy See responded that either understanding was permissible to hold, and that there could be free discussion about this among theologians. And you can look that up in Denzinger, the pre-Vatican II edition, number 2128. So that's what dubia are. Now, you may remember that in 2016, when Francis published his exhortation Amoris Laetitia, after the two synods on the family, all hell broke loose because it appeared that he was opening the doors to allowing unrepentant adulterers to receive Holy Communion. Of course, he didn't say it quite like that, but once you cut through all the smooth-sounding rhetoric and the sophistry and read all the footnotes, that's what he was actually doing. So the Novus Ordo Cardinals Burke, Braunmuller, Meisner, and Caffera wrote five precise questions, dubia, to challenge Francis to say openly and directly whether certain points in his exhortation were indeed saying what they appeared to be saying, and therefore contradicting the prior Catholic teaching, or whether there was some other way these points were to be understood so that they did not contradict prior teaching. So, Francis was pushed against the wall. One way or another, he had to be clear. Either Amoris Laetitia was now teaching something new 
and in contradiction to perennial Catholic doctrine, or the document was not teaching anything new, and therefore nothing had changed, and remarried divorcees could still not receive communion. Well, guess what Francis did? Nothing. He knew that either way he'd be hosed, so he simply did nothing. And when the four cardinals requested an audience with him to talk about it, he simply refused to grant it. And still, he has still not received them to this very day. In fact, two of the cardinals died in 2017. Meanwhile, people like Bill Clinton, Joe Biden, Nancy Pelosi, Emma Bonino, and others have had no problem getting an appointment to meet with Francis for an extended chat. It's just for some perspective. Anyway, to this day, Francis has not answered the dubia from 2016. Meanwhile, a few days ago, it was revealed that more dubia had been submitted to the Vatican just this past July. One set consisted of 10 questions submitted by Cardinal Dominic Duca, the retired Archbishop of Prague, Czech Republic. His dubia concern Amoris Laetitia, just like the original dubia of the other cardinals in 2016. But this time, Francis responded. And what do you know? He made another mess. Of course. Now, we don't have time here to go through all the individual questions and Bergoglio's responses, so let me just give you the long and the short of it. The official Vatican response to the dubia affirms, first, that Amoris Laetitia is an act of the papal magisterium, to which every Catholic must submit. Second, that yes, it does open the possibility of access to confession and communion, quote, when in a particular case there are limitations that mitigate responsibility and guilt. Unquote. Something that, of course, is to be discerned through pastoral accompaniment, but that ultimately belongs to the individual spouses to decide on. Translation, Francis is essentially saying that living in a non-celibate, adulterous union could, depending on the circumstances, be only a venial sin. Now that's obviously complete nonsense. The Portuguese novel's ordo apologist Pedro Gabriel wrote an article for Where Peter Is back in 2019 arguing that very thing, the same argument that Francis made. And we shredded it to pieces back then on our blog. I got it linked in the show notes. Well, with the official papal thesis that adultery can only be a venial sin in particular circumstances, Maybe we will now see promotional flyers in Novus Ordo parishes. Go through an accompaniment session with our merciful pastor and see if adultery is venial for you. You can't make this stuff up. But wait, there's more. Cardinal Duca's dubia weren't the only dubia the Vatican received in July and answered. Cardinals Burke, Brandmuller... Iniguez, Sarah, and Zen had submitted five precise questions regarding the work of the Synod on Synodality on July 10th. The first dubium concerns divine revelation. The cardinals ask Francis to confirm, or perhaps deny, that divine revelation is unchangeable and can never be contradicted, and that it's not subject to change based on new scientific findings or cultural changes of the times. The second dubium is the one that's been getting the most attention. It's basically about finding good elements in mortally sinful situations, such as sodomitic unions. The cardinals want to know if the divinely constituted natural order of male and female for marriage is now to be considered a mere ideal, such that same-sex unions could also be accepted as a possible good. And they're asking this specifically in the context of blessing homo couples. The third dubium asks if synodality can be the supreme regulative criterion of the permanent government of the church without distorting her constitutive order willed by Christ. The fourth dubium asks Francis to confirm 
that there is an essential difference between the ministerial priesthood of the ordained and the universal priesthood in which all the baptized share, and that it has been infallibly decided by John Paul II that women cannot be admitted to priestly ordination. And lastly, the fifth dubium concerns Francis's repeated insistence that confessors are to absolve all penitents of all their sins, always, no matter what. The cardinals ask Francis to confirm that the Council of Trent's dogmatic teaching is still valid, which says that for absolution to be valid, the penitent must be contrite for his sins and have the intention of not committing mortal sin again in the future. Now, these five dubia, these are all really good questions to ask. And this time, though, Francis responded. But of course, as you can probably imagine, he didn't just respond with a clear yes or no. And of course, it's true that sometimes a simple yes or no cannot be given, depending on how a question is framed, what assumptions are built into the question, and so on. And sometimes you need to add more information to ensure clarity. However, what Francis did in his responses, and by the way, don't think for a minute that he wrote those himself. Okay, The fact that he responded with lengthy answers the very next day indicates, to me at least, that he knew these dubia were coming or that someone else was tasked with answering them and given all day to do it. Perhaps Victor Manuel Fernandez, who had just been appointed the new head of the dicastery for the destruction of the faith. Now, let's look at just one response of Francis, which is also representative of the others. In the second dubium, the cardinals ask about marriage versus homo unions. If the former was now to be considered simply the ideal and the latter an acceptable, just not as good option in light of widespread claims that the church could bless homo couples without betraying revealed doctrine. Here is Bergoglio's lengthy reply, a total of seven paragraphs. See how much of it you can take before your mind starts rebelling. Quote, A. The Church has a very clear conception of marriage, an exclusive, stable, and indissoluble union between a man and a woman naturally open to the generation of children. She calls marriage only such a union. Other forms of union do so only in a partial and analogous way, which is why they cannot be called marriage in the strict sense. B. It is not just a matter of names, but the reality we call marriage has a unique essential constitution that requires an exclusive name not applicable to other realities. It is certainly much more than a mere ideal. C. This is why the Church avoids any kind of rite or sacramental that could contradict this conviction and imply that something which is not marriage is recognized as marriage. D. In dealing with persons, however, we must not lose the pastoral charity that must permeate all our decisions and attitudes. The defense of the objective truth is not the only expression of this charity, which is also made of kindness, patience, understanding, tenderness, and encouragement. I think he forgot encounter. Yeah. Therefore, we cannot make ourselves into judges who only deny, reject, exclude. E. Pastoral prudence must therefore properly discern whether there are forms of blessing requested by one or more people that do not convey a misconception of marriage. Because when a blessing is requested, it is a request for help from God, a plea to be able to live better, a trust in a father who can help us to live better. F. On the other hand, even if there are situations that from an objective point of view are not morally acceptable, the same pastoral charity demands that we do not treat as no more than sinners other persons whose guilt or responsibility can be mitigated by various factors that influence subjective imputability. G. 
decisions that may be part of pastoral prudence in certain circumstances need not be transformed into a norm. In other words, it is not appropriate for a diocese, a conference of bishops, or any other ecclesial structure to authorize constantly and officially procedures or rules for every type of affair, since everything that is part of a practical discernment in particular circumstances cannot be elevated to the level of a rule, since this would lead to an intolerable casuistry. Canon law should not and cannot cover everything, nor can conferences of bishops pretend to do so with their various documents and protocols, because the life of the church runs through many channels besides the normative ones. Unquote. Are you still there? Yeah? So, what do you think? What did Francis say? I'd say there's something in there for everyone. And so, not surprisingly, different journalists and different commentators have different opinions about uh, what the Pope actually decided here. And so it's the usual game of, did the Pope just allow blessings for gay couples? And uh, what did Francis really say? And that's exactly what the false Pope wants, of course. Now, for those of us who have learned to read between the lines, this is clearly Bergoglio signaling to go ahead with blessings for same-sex couples. At first, it may be a kind of exception, a toleration, with lots of emphasis on individual cases and pastoral accompaniment and personal discernment. And then there is that caveat that it has to be clear that it's not a marriage. Of course, that won't last long because, you know, discrimination and stuff, and also because they will consider it a marriage and all distinctions will be blurred in the practical order. The exception quickly becomes the rule in Novus Ordo land. But what for now will be considered by Francis's apologists as that crucial criterion that there cannot be any misconception about it being a marriage is also disingenuous. The question is not simply whether it's a marriage, but whether the union is intrinsically evil, sinful. And of course it is. And for that reason alone, it cannot take place. A homosexual union, for that reason alone, cannot be blessed. You cannot invoke God's blessing on something that is intrinsically evil. As a friend of mine noted, it would be like saying that a priest can bless an abortion center as long as he makes clear that it's not a pediatric clinic. Ultimately, Francis' message to each individual cleric is, you decide if you want to bless gay unions. I certainly will not interfere if you do. Unlike saying mass using the 1962 missile, by the way. That's something they need to get Vatican permission for. The consequences of this will be catastrophic. Not only will it unleash chaos in dioceses, where one parish blesses and another condemns, it will also put conservative Novus Ordo priests on the spot, where denying such a blessing could lead to lawsuits and persecution by authorities for so-called hate crimes. Anyway, what Francis did in his responses to the dubia is use the typical modernist strategy. Instead of giving answers that are clear and succinct, he offered a lot of words, words that do not clarify, but obscure. When you read what he wrote, your brain turns to mush. After reading two or three paragraphs, you get the message. And the message is, whatever. His answers include everything. Yes, no, maybe, it depends, you decide. And that's exactly what some astute observers have concluded as well. Luisella Scrosati, for example, writes at the Daily Compass, Yes, yes, or perhaps not. Francis raises more doubts than the dubia. And that's exactly right. By pretending to respond to one doubt, Francis, with his answer, raises three or four more. And then he complains when the cardinals issue follow-up questions, which is exactly what they did. 
On August 21st, Cardinals Burke, Braunmuller, Iniguez, Sarah, and Zen submitted their five dubia again, this time reformulated in light of Bergoglio's obfuscating answers. And to those reformulated dubia, Francis, of course, did not respond, which is why the five Novus Ordo Cardinals now made them public. Now, Cardinal Fernandez, Bergoglio's new doctrinal undertaker, complained about the five cardinals' submission of the reformulated dubia, saying that Francis isn't their slave for errands. But that is not quite true. See, if Francis were what he claims to be, a true pope, then teaching, defending, and clarifying true doctrine would be his very first duty. Unlike, you know, making video messages about food waste or chatting with Bill Clinton about the weather in 2050. Or writing the umpteenth forward to somebody else's book. All right, let's talk about the Synod for a moment. You know, the Synod on Synodality that began on October 4th. The big conference in the Vatican where they're all walking together and listening and discerning like there's no tomorrow. Yep, that one. Vatican reporter Joshua McElwee spoke to Cardinal Pietro Parolin, the Secretary of State, and he said that the Synod is going well and that the Holy Spirit is breathing. Yes, he actually said that. Now, Vatican journalist Diane Montagna had a really good question about that. On Friday, October 6th, at the official press briefing which, by the way, is the only official and approved source of information regarding the Synod while the Assembly is in session, Montagna asked this. A fundamental question about the Synod. Uh, Repeatedly, uh, Synod officials, including yourself, have talked about the Holy Spirit as the protagonist of the the Synod. Over and over again, we hear about the Holy Spirit. Traditionally, the, well, not just traditionally, the Catholic Church discerns the Holy Spirit with the presence by knowing, by determining if something is in accord with divine revelation, the unanimous consensus of the fathers, and apostolic tradition. How is this assembly discerning whether something comes from the Holy Spirit or from another spirit? The spokesman was Dr. Paolo Ruffini, the prefect of the Vatican Dicastery for Communication. In other words, the top dog when it comes to the press and communication and public relations. And he answered in Italian, so there's no point in playing his answer on an English-language podcast, but I will quote the English translation of his answer that Montagna provided on Twitter. Here is how Ruffini answered. Quote, I can respond by citing the creed, which you know. I believe in the Holy Spirit. For the rest, it is the people of God on a journey that is meeting to pray and converse together. In history, as in prior history, moments happen when the people of God gather, pray, God with them, and the Holy Spirit acts. Unquote. Now, Montagna attempted to ask a follow-up question, but the microphone had already been snatched away from her, and so she just used her natural voice to ask, but how do we know that it's the Holy Spirit? But by that point, the vice director of the Holy See press office, Christiane Murray, was already jumping in, saying, thank you, thank you, Dr. Ruffini. Are there other questions? No? Then tomorrow there's another meeting here. So, kudos to Diane Montagna. That was a really great and courageous question to ask, and of course, these people can't answer that, because the whole Senate is just a bunch of bloviating garbage, and in the end, they will come up with whatever they want, or whatever Francis wants, and say it was the Holy Spirit. I mean, let's not kid ourselves, okay? That's all this is. And I'm glad that one journalist has now helped to make that more obvious. All right, so the Synod on Synodality began with an opening mass in St. Peter's Square, presided over by Francis, and although he didn't actually celebrate himself, 
he did give the sermon, as usual. Yeah, that, that mouth has its own engine, really. And he began his sermon with not just a lie, but with a blasphemous one in his second sentence, where he claimed that, quote, John the Baptist doubts that Jesus is really the Messiah, unquote. Blasphemy. It's a lie. St. John the Baptist never doubted that Christ was the Messiah's. He was not, after all, a reed shaken by the wind, as our Lord himself had emphasized. Now, this blasphemous lie is not new for Francis. He had told it a few times before in the last ten years, and we've put together several posts over the years refuting this nonsense in depth, and I'm going to post the most recent one in the show notes for you. The gospel passage that Francis claims tells us of the Baptist's doubt is Matthew 11, verses 2 through 5, which reads, quote, Now when John had heard in prison the works of Christ, sending two of his disciples, he said to him, Art thou he that art to come, or look we for another? And Jesus making answer said to them, Go and relate to John what you have heard and seen. The blind see, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead rise again, the poor have the gospel preached to them. Unquote. At first sight, sure, it sounds like St. John is doubting. But that's only at first sight, and once you consult approved pre-Vatican II Catholic scripture commentaries, writings of the Church Fathers, and so on, you will understand very quickly that the true understanding of this passage is that the Baptist was sending his disciples to our Lord to inquire about his Messiahship, not because he doubted it, but because they did. Now, Francis knows this. There's no way he doesn't know. He's had a Jesuit education. And say what you will about that, it is intense. I mean, it's not difficult to look that up. Right? Besides, even if he truly didn't know, well, it was his job to know. Okay? It's his responsibility, more than any other person's on earth, if he really is what he claims to be, to look up how the church understands this passage before teaching the whole world about it, right? Especially before blasting St. John for doubting our Lord. For heaven's sake, St. John the Baptist recognized the true Messiah when he and the Messiah were both still in the womb. And when our Lord came to be baptized by him as an adult, he witnessed the Holy Ghost descend upon him as a dove, and he testified, Behold the Lamb of God, even though he had never met him. So Francis began the Senate on Synodality with a mendacious blasphemy. If that isn't a sign of what to expect for the remainder of the Synodal journey. Tradcast Express is a production of Novus Ordo Watch. Check us out at tradcast.org. And if you like what we're doing, please consider making a tax-deductible contribution at novusordowatch.org slash donate.